All right, so um, I'll start by reading this. Uh, see how, I, how it goes. Cross panico oco teoria zavera ca ratio noi paranoi, or through conspiracy panic to rational paranoia. Um, so that was my effort, uh, and and so our our own conspiracy that Nebo and I had, uh, Nebo Shea and I had, was um, to put this together. So I'll, I'll just start by saying. Um, this question often pops up. I get asked it. It comes up in the news. I'll show you examples. You can just get on Google, right, and start putting in why do people believe, and the autofill in Google will put in conspiracy theories. But I want you to, to take a look at what else is listed along with those, right? Um, so God, <laughs> Earth is flat, astrology, ghosts, right? And that's Google's version of when you before you get to conspiracy theories you go through these others and and already ask the question like what brings those things together um uh to say like oh these things you know sort of belong together in the kind of like why we ask why do people believe in these things so um more recently for me um in the last uh i would say eight to ten months um i've been whoa what's happened here um Okay, there we go. Um, I have been um, asked by a number of journalists, uh, probably 15 to 20 different news outlets about the phenomenon of QAnon, um, which is uh, you know, significant in the US and also a little bit in Europe and elsewhere. I don't want to necessarily go into QAnon, but if we have questions, I can talk about it. But this is the new sort of way of phrasing it. It's like, you know, why do people believe sane people right? Normal people believe bizarre conspiracy theories. So I get asked this question a lot. And for years, I've been trying to figure out how to answer and also not answer the question, right, at the same time. So um, uh, that's not easy. So one of the things I'm hoping to do tonight is to talk about conspiracy theories without using the, the term or very much at all, right? And so that's the thing is, so I'll be doing these different avenues to try to address some questions that are loaded in this question. Um, and so this is what I will try to do. But here are some, it, it's, it happens so often. This is Time Magazine. They keep answering the question. So they answered it in 2017, but then they answered it in 2015 too. So they keep asking, they keep answering. So that to me is the interesting question is like, why does it keep getting asked? And why does it keep getting answered? Um, but there's something, you know, I mean, we have, to, we have to almost ask ourselves, like, how often do we have to ask the same question before we realize maybe the question is the problem rather than uh, anything else? So the, the constant asking of this is what I'm interested in. This is more recently, these are all from like around the same time in 2017. Um, this is more recent. A um, couple of these from just the last two weeks three weeks. Uh, um, and these are different things. You know, Al Jazeera asked the question, National Geographic asked the question as though this is like about like animals in the wild. Um, uh, 538, I don't know if you know 538, is this very specialized site in the US that always makes these very specific numbered predictions of elections or, um, and they're often very wrong, but they still get this, they have a lot of value attached to them for being very scientific and precise. And so they're interested in it too. Um, okay, so a few years ago, I wrote a piece, a small piece in response to some of this, and I called it millions of Americans believe conspiracy theories exist. Now, what that means is not that millions of Americans believe conspiracies exist. It's that millions of Americans believe that this thing called conspiracy theories exists. And I said, maybe it doesn't. Maybe conspiracy theories themselves, why do we believe in them? In that, not why do people believe a conspiracy theory, but why do we believe in, the, in that there's something out there in the world called conspiracy theory? I don't say there's no conspiracy theory. I'm just saying, why do people invest so much in it? Okay, so people say, well, what is, the, what is a conspiracy? What, how would you define it? Uh, this is where it also gets frustrating, I would say. So I, I usually maybe would say this as an experiment, but um, if we take this, what I think is a fairly decent definition of something, I'm not sure what it is, but a deliberate plot by a secret group to alter the course of events with significant results. It sounds okay, but you know, 
maybe we can talk about this at the end. What is the first thing that maybe comes to your mind when I say that? Um, uh, and I will say also that this can apply to so many different things, right? That's the thing, right? I mean, it, it, even in one classic US-based conspiracy theory, and it, I would say like uh, most of my examples will be in the US. This would describe both the, the people who believe that in 9-11, 2001, that the Twin Towers were taken down by insiders in the government, in the US government. Okay, that also applies to the official story about Al-Qaeda and 19 hijackers doing this too. It's the same thing, right? I mean, that, meaning it, this applies to both. So, so, you know, I'm still looking if anybody wants to invent a definition that applies consistently and exclusively to some things, I'm, I'm ready to listen, but I think that's, it's hard to do. So I'm not that interested in it. Okay. So, um, uh, an another way to go about this is to understand that in 1967, um, the, the CIA, uh, you know, had this memo to its, some of its agents. This was uncovered in the last few years by an author named Lance DeHaven, who, who, uh, in the freedom of information act, got this memo, it was a secret memo inside the CIA. Basically, the CIA was very worried about all the, the, uh, the skepticism around the J John F. Kennedy assassination, that it was, they didn't believe, people didn't believe it was the w one person, Lee Harvey Oswald. The CIA said, well, we need to you know, counteract, we need to stop all these different theories and accounts out there. And they used the word conspiracy theory in there. They call them conspiracy theories. They didn't invent the term, um, but what we did see soon after this 1967 memo is an increase in the frequency of that term in, uh, in journalism, right? Um, and if you count it over many years afterwards, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's astronomical how, how often the, the term is used. So, so there's at least a moment that we recognize that the, that the CIA was invested in stopping something that they called conspiracy theories. Okay, here's another way to say why the phrase doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, so a lot of this is about frustrations. Um, uh, both Hillary Clinton and Trump um, over during the, you know, uh, in 2016 and 2017, um, talked about the other w ones as, you know, uh, around conspiracies. So Hillary Clinton in a famous moment uh, in the 90s talked about the vast right wing conspiracy. And then in 2016 says it's even better funded now than it was in the past. OK, well, that's a she says there's a big conspiracy. That's a conspiracy theory, right? So Trump, um, this is in, 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 in 2017, I believe, or 2018. Um, says, if the re election had been reversed in 2016, they would call, and we said, hey, the Russians were behind it, they would call us a conspiracy theory. And it turns out that's exactly a few days ago what um, the Washington Post uh, talked about in terms of pure insanity about the, about the, the Trump version of the 2020 election being stolen, right? So I call this mutually assured disqualification. If you know the phrase mutually assured, assured destruction in the, during the Cold War, that was the model, right, of like that the US and the Soviets um, could build up their nuclear stockpile um, because uh, if anybody released one, they would all destroy everybody. So, um, so it was okay because everybody knew that the other that they, everybody would die, so it's okay to continue to have the the stockpile. Well, okay, so you can just can keep continuing escalating your 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 phrases about this is the conspiracy theory over there. It doesn't matter because it eventually comes back to you as well. Okay, this might be the last way I do this. Um, maybe some would say, well, um, what about reason? What about public reason? What about um, uh, rationality? So. I'll just take this phrase from Kant, uh, what is enlightenment? The public use of one's reason must be free at all times, and this alone can bring enlightenment to mankind. Sounds pretty good. Who has circulated this recently? Um, the Doctors for Enlightenment, which are German uh, corona skeptics, right, who said, like, we base our skepticism about the coronavirus on Kant and on reason. Okay, so Reason does not solve the issue either because other people, anybody can claim rationality. Okay, so we find ourselves constantly in this uh, uh, dead end uh, with the term. So I say maybe it's time to diagnose the diagnosticians 
Uh, and to ask a question, uh, what would it mean to have a healthy assessment about social harm and social health? Um, oh, I will say uh, uh, right now that, that in the next three days, if you want to continue this conversation, we will be having what we've called terminology ambulances, right? Uh, so so um, uh, that uh, at 6 p.m., um, either here in the space or somewhere else, but also online, if there's a, 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 a term, a concept, um, or something that you want immediate attention to, <laughs> like, I'll be here, we'll be here uh, to, uh, uh, to work on those things. So, so but right now, we, we'll talk about this as diagnosis. Um, and how do we begin to talk about the genres or the narratives of describing power? And how has that been so impoverished um, that we, you know, uh, um, uh, that we, we don't have enough of, of the spaces and the forms to, to discuss power and to describe and analyze our own beliefs, not just the beliefs of them, of the other, of the conspiracy theorists, right? Of those we disagree with, but our own investments and our own beliefs. Um, uh, there's a little Reddit meme there. I won't get into that one, but it's about people who've tried like, oh, how about rational skepticism? Well, you find out that those people are very much attached to their own beliefs too, those rational skeptics, right? Um, uh, or pronoia, as Rob Brezhny has, has discussed. Pronoia basically says, you can believe that the world is out there coming for you, but they have good intentions. Like, don't be afraid of them. Pronoia is like, yeah, the people have, uh, you know, blessings. They send you blessings in the world. So people are trying to figure this out. Okay, keep going. Okay, so here's how I translate this question. Why do people believe? My translation is, um, yeah, why don't you trust me? Right? That's, that's what this question of why do people believe really boils down to. And as we've, we've, been, we've just been talking about in different conversations, um, it's like, which institution do we invest our faith in? Which institutions or discourses or actors um, do, we, do we send our skepticism to, right? So, I think it's worth reflecting on the a combination of skepticism and faith that m moves us um, in a variety of ways, not just about beliefs, um, but about um, our ways of being with each other, um, especially politically and political action. And what kind of stubborn attachments do we have um, to, our, to our own skepticism and to our faith? Okay, so this is where this book, um, uh, you know, written many years ago, but it came out in 2008. What I argue in it is, in Conspiracy Panics, is that it's not a lack of trust that's out in the world. It's a very active mistrust, right? It's a very important thing to distinguish, not just not having trust, but um, it's a kind of force in the world, right? It's not an absence of a force, it's actually very uh, positive in the sense of being out in the world. Um, uh, uh, and it's born from suspicion or something I call popular skepticism. And I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, popular skepticism. So what I argue there is that skepticism is, is something inherent in liberal governance. It's a requirement of a certain model of li liberal governance that's taken form in the, in the West, which is um, one should always be suspicious of too much government. Right, that's the kind of foundational thing in the the U.S. Um, so um, uh, you know we need to respect freedom, the social, the space of the economy. But the you know so always be skeptical of too much authority, too much intervention. Um, okay, that's liberal governance. It's required, but you can't have too much of it. Right, it needs to be moderated. It has to be moderate. Um, uh, so so that is always the the, the dynamic in in liberal governance for, you know, hundreds of years. Now, what happens at times is skepticism uh, becomes excessive. It, it mutates and then it turns on those, that liberal governance itself. It, it turns, right? It, 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 it's not within its regulations. Um, it moves against the very techniques that try to moderate it. Okay, and so what I argue, not in the book, but what I've been talking about over the last couple of years is how popular skepticism uh, has really uh, uh, expanded, exploded, um, uh, in, especially in the West, and, and, and a few reasons. 
um, that uh, this this popular skepticism. So this book came out in two thousand and eight, right? So you think about this as the as the kind of uh, precipice of social media, right? I mean, two thousand and eight. I'm still working on like through this on about websites and you know, um, uh, what we, you know, called web 1.0. So this is before 2.0. Um, but the way that the technological platforms were able to enhance the circulation of skepticism, um, that's the first thing. And we, we, we know that people talk about that a lot, right? Oh, it's everywhere. You know, there's sharing in, uh, you know, uh, on Facebook, specifically Facebook groups, now WhatsApp groups, we'll talk about WhatsApp in a second. Um, the second one was economics, which is related to this, that once an economic model of these technological platforms depended on sociality, depended on you sharing, it's just said like, keep sharing, keep circulating, keep communicating, keep connecting, right? Then there was nothing to say, oh, you should think about what you're sharing, maybe make some decisions, you know, just like, just, just be social, right? And share. Uh, the third one that, contributed to the rise of popular skepticism is uh, popular culture. Um, I'll also say the first two, um, if you want to, uh, 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 my friend and colleague Jason Harson has written about um, the rise of rumors, and he's also pinpointed some of these things, especially the first two as part of the circulation of these, of, of uh, rumor, what he calls rumor bombs. Okay, but the third one um, is popular culture. And in the, in the first decade of the 21st century, in the US at least, the rise of so many um, uh, TV shows, many of them reality shows, that were organized around you being uh, uh, skeptical about somebody else's intentions. Are they a real person? Are they a fake? Um, uh, there, there, there was, uh, I think it was a show called, Dis it was about detecting deception. Always like, how do I detect if somebody's actually being true to me um, uh, or not? Are they lying to me? Sometimes it was the entire show was based around it. Catfish, for instance, you always think about like, is somebody online trying to, who wants to say they want to date me? Um, if, do you know the, the Catfish MTV show? Um, this is, or it was a movie also, uh, Catfish. It was about people who are fake online dating. Um, uh, for years, they date online, um, uh, and, but it's a fake persona. One person is fake. Um, and so, it, so the, there's an MTV show on like um, visiting the people, right? So they bring them together and say like, oh, you were a fake. Is that okay if you were a fake or not? You know, so, so, so there's so many uh, um, reality shows that were either centrally about um, detecting fakes um, or it just becomes part of it. I mean, just like, uh, are, are you, you know, if Big Brother, like, are you um, in Survivor, are you really my ally or are you just using me strategically to win, right? Are we really a team or are we not a team? Are we in an alliance? So, so to me, that meant that skepticism became more and more a part of entertainment too. So it, it sort of created in the viewer this, um, uh, this increased skepticism. And finally, in the US, for sure, after 9 11, the the you know the U.S. war on terror at home in the domestic scene meant people should um, be suspicious of their neighbors, right? Be suspicious of is somebody a potential terrorist? Is the bag, you know, um, that's on the, the the train platform, is that a bomb? So so we were constantly being told like you should look at the world through very suspicious eyes and be skeptical about things. So. No wonder then you put these four things together and you have an explosion in something I call popular skepticism. Okay. Uh, so to, to, to shift a little then, um, uh, that has risen, but now we talk about trust and how do we talk about faith? Like what people actually believe in and how they trust each other. Um, so in the, uh, what we've seen, I think lately, is the rise of this idea of the truth is not some kind of uh, common fact-based, science evidence-based thing, but it's um, your truth. It's a different kind of truth. It's like the it's like you speak uh, not just what you believe, but you speak yourself. You are your you know you speak your inner inner inner, inner truth, um, and it's almost like when when we say, uh, I mean, how, how do you, how do you say here like a true friend? Probably. Pravi, pravi, right? It's like, yeah, pravi, like a true, um, right? So that kind of truth is like, what does it mean to be um, uh, 
a true friend, not like, is, a, like a, is this truly a chair, right? Is this really a chair? Um, but, but, um, but something else there, right? So, so Will Davies in this great Guardian piece on WhatsApp, is about WhatsApp, the platform, said that as the public has become more distant and more fake um, and impersonal, it's the private group that becomes the source of sympathy, authenticity, uh, relatability, and trust. Right, we trust our our groups, our little groups, and I think that's really fascinating to start thinking about that kind of um, trust and truth. And I'll also say right here before I move to the next one, this is related to popular skepticism too. Is who can be believed? You know, there's a question of who does one. Um, who, there's a whole history of disbelieving some people, and um, the the work of Sarah Benet Weiser, who's on the on the Zoom right now, um, uh, and, and and her co-author uh, uh, Kat Higgins are writing about um, this, the history of kind of believability and how that's organized around race and gender. Right? I mean, I mean, what does it mean to to not trust women? I mean, women, that has been so. Uh, such a core part of um, of Western ideas of truth is like to not actually um, trust women and not believe women. Um, so um, uh, so there, so I want to highlight that too. Okay, but trust groups. So I'm looking online to think about faith and trust and truth. Um, and uh, if we think about how influencers, lifestyle influencers, were important to both COVID, uh, if you want to call it misinformation, or here it says conspiracy theories, QAnon conspiracy theories, right? What they wanted to, you can hear what they're saying. It's not they want to just manipulate their, their followers. They, they think of it as being both relatable, but, but a, a form of care, right? It's like they know their followers trust them to give them some, some truth about the world. And this is what they're going to give them, right? So it's, it's changing, I think, what, where we can think about how, um, uh, how smaller units, affinities, and groups are forming um, truth communities too, um, and, and truth groups. And so it's it, it's important not to just dismiss them, um, but to think about them empirically. And I, you know, I think I don't do that empirical work, but I think it'd be interesting to do that. So you might know about the uh, Dunbar's number. Uh, it was the it, it became cited a lot when when. Um, Facebook came around and the Dunbar number is, it says, I think it's like 150, right? 100, you can only really have a relationship with 150 people in your life. I mean, like at any given time to actually do the, the kind of relationship work, there's a limit to how much any one human can have. And so this was a question like, how meaningful can your connections really be on, on Facebook when, if you had more than 150? So this was a big discussion in 2010 or something, right? Dunbar's number. So what does it mean now when we think about trust and truth um, if, if we move that number to the WhatsApp limit of 256? Maybe there's something going on um, that's happening in, in groups that makes us rethink what a meaningful contact is or what a meaningful relationship is. I just posed that as a question. Um, okay. Um, I'm interested now in squads, so I'll just put that out, like, because um, I think it's one of these new economic, cultural, social um, units of affinity and association that are happening. So you hear like squad goals. Uh, uh, it has a very uh, significant history in fascism as well, the squadrismo of, of the Italian fascists, um, how they organize their uh, masculine groups and gangs. Um, and so, so I'm trying to think now th through th this idea of, of, of squads as um, an understudied unit uh, of affinity and association that, that we might want to think about when we think about how be beyond just a public or community or um, a social network, but the squad, which is also pretty tight. There's a tight kind of uh, sensibility there of, like, of, of, of maybe a kinship. Uh, unit, a new kind of kinship unit too. Okay. Okay. Let me see where I am. How long have I gone? Um, 20, 25 minutes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Uh, and I, I, I told you yesterday that I wasn't going to have a video. I'm going to have a video, but it needs no sound. I'll just share my screen with a video in, in a minute. Is that okay? Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a lot about fantasies um, um, uh, and faith. And uh, I teach a class on consumer culture 
in the US. And so I'm familiar with US consumer culture and which has a lot more of, of this, but I'm, since I've been here the last four days, I've been noticing ads. I walk around, I always look at, at billboards and advertisements and try to see some themes in, in ads. And um, like I said, this happens in the US too, but I, I saw it very concentrated in my little time here, which is, um, it's a fairly classic advertising thing, right? That, that if you buy something, your fantasies will come true, right? Um, you will be happy, you will be successful. But lately, ads are very upfront. It's not just like, you'll be happy, but it's like, we know you have fantasies and wishes and desires um, uh, and dreams. And so, um, you know, nurture those dreams, right? Um, everything uh, that you desire is going to be possible, right? Um, it's not just like, buy this, you'll be happy. It's like the world of, of fantasy completion and fulfillment um, uh, awaits through these products, right? So some of these, um, these are two of my favorites because this one's on my hotel, <laughs> um, uh, um, ab about displaying your, your true nature, right? Your true self, uh, this guy through the, through the, through the water, right? Um, um, and, um, and, and I was looking at these commercials for the, for the Yana iced tea, right? And it just says, you know, uh, just relax. But then if you watch the commercials, it's like, if you relax, um, how you imagine something happening will happen. Like they show somebody like they didn't drink it and they, they fall off a, a diving board. Uh, they, then they drink it and time goes back and then they do this great dive or it's the end of a night. It's a first date. The guy wants to come in for the kiss. Uh, it doesn't work out. Drinks the tea. Time reverses. The kiss it happens. Wonderful. So, uh, right? So, so, I, I, I point these out. I, I don't, I'm not making fun of these, right? Because again, this is this is how advertising works. But it, if we begin to think that that w if we're promoting in in the in the consumer cultural industry the notion that you make you can have your desires come true, you can make your world um, uh, happen. You just show your true self. I mean, why wouldn't? Um, I'll just jump over that one. Um, why wouldn't uh, uh, you know? QAnon uh, become its own reality? Why wouldn't people have their own truths? I mean, this is like whatever you want, whatever you wish can, can happen, can be fulfilled. Um, so let's talk about fantasy and 5G for a moment. Um, 5G is one of those major conspiracy theories, right, around. So um, and we could talk about that. But I found yesterday, I found this commercial. Um, this is why I'm doing it today. I didn't know I bought this commercial yesterday. I'm sorry, Nana. So um, uh, this is an ad for 5G for the UK. Um, it's a little long. It might be like two minutes. Um, and you can see how much money has gone into creating this, uh, uh, this imagination for the future of 5G. Um, and we won't need the sound, but, um, but I want to... Um, Okay. Okay. All right. It's it's okay. It you don't. It's just it, the sound is like minor com compared to like what you're about to see, which is okay. I'll just tell you. It starts with um, uh, the this woman coming home in the, in the present in the UK or London or probably or whatever, and she um, she comes home and she sees the bleakness uh, of the world. Oop, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Um, um, Okay. Okay. I'm trying to find the oops. The okay. Let's try this again. Um, I don't want the Facebook event to be up. Uh, I want this to be up. Okay. Okay. Let's try it here. Okay. So it's three minutes. Um, and um, okay. So everybody, yeah. So there's. No, we're not going to play the sound. Yeah, because it'll do feedback. Oops. Okay. So here she comes, she's coming home. Let me just back. You can just see how much has gone into this. Future is bleak. Oh, that's very sad.
This was made by the um, Wyden and Kennedy, which is one of the major um, uh, advertising agencies. One of the top ones, right? So you can imagine how many millions and millions of pounds went into this. Exactly, exactly. Taylor, sorry, Taylor. The what? Uh, Taylor, teaser, like, oh, yeah, yeah, teaser, exactly. That's for the, for the, it's like, you don't need to read the book. We're just going to make it for you uh, pretty soon. But yeah. Um, I know, it's like, but I'll tell you the, the punchline, the, the, and at the end of this, there's a, another layer that uh, I'll just tell you about. Um, this is the true fantasy for the for the UK, right? Like you win, they win the football, right? So, of course, it's the biggest fantasy for the future. Okay. All right, it's about to end, okay? The fastest 5G network, great. Ah, she's back. Okay, we're back to reality. Um, and, okay, she would like to sniff, she can't. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, um, uh, I know there was a long way to do that, but I think it's, it's really important to just see the effort that went into that. And the reason, uh, oh, I gotta stop the share and reshare, sorry. Um, and share screen, we'll share that one. So what was incredible about that too is the, the news stories that accompanied this when this came out said, this is a, an amazingly optimistic ad, right? They said like, the, because the whole narrative is about optimism. She's bored, the bleak future, and that future is just seen as the, the utopia, right? It's, it's the best future ever. So I, I say all this, we can talk about many things about it, but um, like this alone would make me want to question 5G, right? <laughs> like, like if, if something as simple as an infrastructure for broadband needs to have this amount of, uh, uh, of promotion, of advertising, then uh, it seems like something's being imposed on us uh, and, and we have to sort of imagine it uh, this way. Otherwise, okay, it's just like, you know, it's, it's just broader, broadband, right? It's just bigger, it's fat. But, but the amount that it, that it does this would, you know, uh, so I, I'm not surprised that people are bombing, you know, towers, 5G towers, um, because they're not because they're right about the, um, uh, you know, that the towers damage, you know, cellular level. I mean, uh, it's because something is appearing without a kind of process to discuss it. And instead, we get this as the way to imagine it, right? Um, so we don't have the spaces for the the, 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 the proper discussions about about five G. Instead, um, we 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 are supposed to, like her, feel bleak about a, a, our contemporary moment and see this this as not only the future but the optimistic future. <laughs> like the makers of the ad say, like we really wanted to make something that was like hopeful and and, and exciting and optimistic. And I mean, it's very, very, very bizarro. Um, okay, so uh, again, this is why I bring this up also because it's related to conspiracy theories in the way people talk about QAnon, which has created its own version of reality of a video game, an alternate reality game. And um, it's not surprising that when people get fed um, that the idea that your fantasy world can come true um, and they have games and technologies that allow that alternate reality to be played out, um, that people will do it around, around whatever theory it is. Okay. But now let's leave the world of fantasy. Let's go to back to the ground. Okay, it's 35 minutes. Let's try to go back to um, how do we want to talk maybe about some things? How do I want to talk about some things? About um, the uh, things like contemporary struggles around um, the th these things we call conspiracy theories. And 
um, one thing after some discussion with Nebush over over these last few weeks, we've been trying to. He's been getting me to think about um, a class orientation to this, and maybe. Um, uh, and so, in our conversations, what I'm kind of thinking through is how there's a what we might be seeing as a kind of a middle class hostility with itself at times, also o over against what what some in that middle class considered to be the, the the working class or the or or the poor poor people in terms of their thinking but we what we might be seeing at least when it comes to the the US is a certain kind of a professional institutionalized middle class um, uh, that's in in conflict with a version of the petite bourgeoisie of a certain uh, merchant class a small mom and pop uh, what they call mom and pop shops um, uh, uh, in the US the suburban uh, uh, U.S. that tends to be drawn to things like QAnon and other conspiracy phenomena. Okay, so here's let me say a few things about about how I, I see this playing out. Uh, this the way this is about a certain kind of classness within the middle class. You see a lot of language about big versus small in in the in the U.S. In, around um, in, in these sort of emergent what I would consider right wing or libertarian ideas that get associated with a certain type of conspiracy theories, big versus small. The first one, one is the, the medical establishment, right? Big, big pharma versus natural uh, healing. So you see that happening there, right? So don't trust big medicine, Western medicine, um, go with healing. So that's the first one. I don't have a slide for that because I'm more media studies. So I look at things like platforms. So you have this, amazing, uh, you know, discourse against the, the media platform owners that, that are monopolizing, right, or the oligarchs of media platforms. So the, the, the US right wing on their own platforms, so Gab, Parler, um, uh, Frank Speech, they're all against Zuckerberg, Gates, Jack Dorsey, Twitter, right? Um, um, they've, they've been banned from, many of them have been banned because of the things they say from those platforms. But more than that, they're saying like, uh, you know, we are the entrepreneurs um, of media platforms and we can't, uh, we can't play in the same market anymore because these are uh, monopolies or oligopolies um, on the social media, right? So, so they're the small, media entrepreneurs, platform entrepreneurs against the, the big ones. We also have internal struggles. Um, in, lately, just when was this a few days ago? Uh, well, late, late June, um, Rumble, another one of these sites, uh, you know, Donald Trump has an account on there. And so the other two, Gab and Parler, which are the other right wing platforms are very angry because Rumble got Trump to have an account. They don't, they don't have an account for him. Um, um, Big versus small news media. These are some of the the, the, the small right wing uh, news sites that are also saying like we are the news. Um, you know, don't trust Fox even. Don't trust Fox. Don't trust other mainstream media. Um, but it's again big versus small. And then, yeah, okay. It's there, yes, please. Ah, ah, okay. Characteristic of uh, fascist, um, 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 let's say, uh, mobilization in twenties, thirties, in, in Germany especially. Ah, okay, right. So, so uh, I don't know if everybody heard that, but yeah, uh, uh, that one of the main books about fascism was called Petit Bourgeois. No, no, no. One in this one in that book. Oh, in that book. Uh, uh, that that. Type of ah. anger and sentiment, anger. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, resentment against uh, monopolies, big players, big, big players. Monopolies ah. called exactly ah. petty bourgeois anti monopolies. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I didn't know that. Um, by the way, sorry, did I lose my water? Uh, okay, maybe I don't have okay. Good, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, but that was that was great to know. So um, so and also what's happening in the U.S., this is what I've been tracking are things I call um, the layer of agitator influencers. And these are um, these are not really 
tied to a kind of a media main media uh, uh, news website, but they're not just uh, people with you know social media accounts either. There are those people too. Um, but uh, thanks. Um, um, and so these are like could be one person. It could be again a squad maybe of them that have their own shows. They they run like daily uh, podcasts and and other kinds of video casts. Um, and I think it's important instead of just thinking about the um, sort of like the kind of great amorphous mass of believers, we need to focus on the distributors of certain kinds of information, whether we call the conspiracy theory misinformation. You know, it's just like, I would consider them political agitators, and many of them are classic, you know, uh, again, like uh, neo-fascist or, or fascist kinds of um, uh, agitators. And so I've been reading... It's hard to read on, on this, but uh, a book from the from the forties called "Prophets of Deceit: A Study of the Techniques of the American Agitator." Um, uh, Leo Lowenthal and Gutterman. So this came out of the Frankfurt School. Um, uh, you know the. Uh, Adorno and, and other people sort of work on the authoritarian personality was the main kind of thing that came out of this moment. But um, but I think this is even a more apt book nowadays because it really studies the rhetorical techniques of the radio influencers at the time and the kinds of ways they were appealing to uh, to people. And I think um, uh, for people like me in media and communication studies, um, it's important to kind of name and locate that world as well. Um, and as this is a great piece uh, in Boston Review, and I thank Neboisha for, for putting me onto uh, a, a different article on diagonalism that, that referenced this article. Um, and the Callison and Slobodian uh, authors really do a, a great job at kind of sociologically discussing the different kinds of actors that are at work right now, freelance media hustlers, movement messiahs, entrepreneurial contrarians. I mean, it's a, it's a really great layout of what they call diagonalism around this. And so, so to me, it's important to, to find that as a way of talking about this middle class that's sort of at war with itself, it's hostile with itself. Um, um, we also in the US are seeing these incredible mind blowing alliances too. So, um, you know, this will be familiar to people who, who, who are familiar with US news uh, uh, or, or websites or, or media personalities. So the one on the right is uh, Tucker Carlson, who probably has the most popular show on Fox News. But next to him is Glenn Greenwald, um, uh, who is well known for his work with, um, uh, with Edward Snowden um, and who's ostensibly been on the left. But he appears, he has appeared frequently on, you know, a very right wing Tucker Carlson show because they try to find common ground, right, um, uh, against sort of the big state, the surveillance state, sometimes is what they go on. The other one is Steve Bannon and, and his, um, you know, video show. Um, and that's Naomi Wolf, who also famously wrote um, a, a book on the, the beauty myth, uh, right? And so, um, uh, and a, and a well-known, uh, uh, you know, feminist author from the 90s and who's drifted increasingly in the 21st century to libertarianism and to the right. And now she's appearing on Steve Bannon's show um, to talk about anti-vaccine and anti-corona. So, so we're also seeing these interesting left-right alliances in this media sector um, uh, that's important to look at. Okay, so how, how do I reframe this? We might be seeing a civil war within the middle class. Um, uh, again, I specifically talk about the US here and I'm gonna try to wrap up in about five to 10 minutes, five to seven minutes. Both have entrepreneur organizers in them, although one is a more kind of professionalized, settled, organized inside of institutions, has more institutional power. Those would be the conspiracy panickers, the ones who are in uh, um, you know, uh, professional journalism, who are professional pundits, right? Who are intellectuals, who are constantly talking about the problems with conspiracy theories, who are constantly writing. Why do people believe in conspiracy theories and answering that question? Um, uh, so some have more institutional power than others. And that group, the panickers, speaks for and organizes a public um, uh, and a public as the moderate center. And so there, this is inside the center. So what I call, I, I call this a, um, a restoration war. And in a piece I wrote, it came out in 
last year in 2020 called Civil Society Must Be Defended. And that's an ironic term, ironic phrase. Um, it's drawn off of Foucault, Michel Foucault's book, uh, which is called Society Must Be Defended. Um, but uh, so a civil society must be defended. And what I'm arguing is that what we're seeing right now is, a, is, is what I call a restoration war. And I think there are two wars I'll talk about in a second. And so this one is an attempt to restore the center. Um, and it's organizing a, a new uh, nexus or connecting uh, apparatus between the press, between a, a sector of intellectuals, the pundits, and, and politicians, um, in order to reestablish the political spectrum around this question of the center and then against the, the extremes. Um, I'll jump over moral panics. It's, it's where this, the conspiracy panics comes from, but um, I can talk about it later. I, I don't want to spend too much time. Um, uh, I want to start wrapping up because I want to get to Facebook, what, what's happening not, now with Facebook. Uh, so what we've started seeing over the last couple of years is this idea, again, from this kind of restoration war perspective that um, the conspiracists, the conspiracy theorists are not just out there and they're believing, but now they're organized. They are networked. They're a threat. Organized conspiracy theorist networks have launched an all out information war across Europe. So they have declared war against people they say are declaring war. Right. Um, and you can see with, you know, cannibals, aliens, lizards, you know, it's like this, this, the, the worst, <laughs> the most extreme things. Um, uh, uh, get put into this guardian piece. I have to say, because this is from my own university at Rutgers um, University, uh, there's this center um, for per community protection and resilience. I'm not part of this center. I don't think they would ever, I might be, might be studied by them, but I would never, they would never have me, I think in their uh, network contagion institute, right? So they, they, they have this affiliation with the Network Contagion Research Institute. And what they study, they study conspiracy theories um, about COVID, the QAnon thing. But, but the one I want to point to is the one over here. They also study what they call networked enabled anarchy. And so um, they are also studying how, uh, you know, um, various kinds of uh, anti-police, defund the police, uh, abolitionist projects under the name of uh, anarchism are contagious and potentially seditious. So, so this is, I think, for me, encapsulates what I think my main concern is, is like this easy shift to study the contagion of conspiracy theories to then all kinds of political positions become the real target. What I think is the real target for this, uh, these panics uh, is um, is, is, is subversive action and thought. Um, uh, and, and conspiracy theories are an easy, easy phrase to get to that. Um, okay. I'll ju jump over that. Um, but we know that over the last three to four years, these main platforms have been changing around, you know, uh, trying to limit and, and ban, uh, extremist content. Um, you know, Facebook calls it bad actors. I mean, it's just like, it's such a, almost like a clunky cold war term. We have bad actors, um, in the world. Um, or this other one, coordinated inauthentic behavior is what they call it too. Um, uh, so, so I find that to be fascinating. And these are things that have, they've done this in response to this nexus of journalism that's been shaming them and, uh, U S government agencies that have, uh, or made requests to limit the kinds of um, uh, uh, seditious speech or dangerous speech. Um, YouTube, Twitter, Google, they've all done this. So what was this a couple of years ago, maybe? Maybe two years ago, back to skepticism, right? Facebook had these ads like, um, here, this, these things are not your friend, right? You need to ask who's really your friend? Um, what's real, what's fake? Fake news, not your friend, clickbait, not your friend. Fake accounts are not your friends, but trust Facebook. They'll tell you. <laughs> so that's where you go, the faith and the skepticism. Um, uh, uh, now Facebook is telling us who is really your friend. Okay. So I don't know if you've encountered this here. I think they're, they're rolling this out now in the last four or five days on Facebook, um, which is if you are, um, uh, uh, if you open up a page or, um, uh, depending on who your friends are, this will pop up from, um, uh, from Facebook. Are you concerned that someone, you know, is becoming an extremist? Um, we care, right? 
So it's it, it sounds almost like, you know, a psychologist's concern, right? Are you concerned that someone you know might be, you know, having mental health issues, basically, right? Um, we care. We would like to intervene. How you can get help, right? Um, and the other one, Kevin, <laughs> or your ever name. I haven't received this one yet. I, I feel bad. I, I should. I, I really hope I would have received one by now, but I haven't. Kevin, you may have been exposed to harmful extremist content recently. And that's the language of Corona, right? That's already the language of the virus. You might have been exposed to Corona. You were over here at this, at this restaurant uh, and we've tra traced, you, you know, you might have been exposed to this. So, so this is the language now of uh, uh, in your, in your, that you receive uh, as, a, as a Facebook user. I did get this one though. This is, I really like this one. So um, Facebook's redirect initiative it claims to combat violent extremism and dangerous organizations. So I liked this page. This is uh, an author, a book called A World Without Police, All right? Um, that's the name of the book. So I liked that page a few days ago about this page. This page, says Facebook, may share content that violates our community standards. Um, so what's ironic about this is that this book argues that if you have a strong community, you actually don't need police. It imagines a world without police because it says, you know, police are there for a variety of reasons, but if, if your community is strong enough, you don't actually need police. Um, so this says, well, that violates community standards. <laughs> if you want to make an argument that you're, you're, you, you want a strong community, that itself is already a violation of community standards. So this is what's happening. But what I also love about social media is people are responding already. Um, uh, right, you know, people are, are, are reacting with humor and memes. Um, uh, so this is now on the left, a filter that you can put on your profile pic. Um, uh, and this is a friend of mine who actually has the communist Britney Spears as her profile pic anyway. But now you, you too can say like, you are exposing your friends to extremist content. And the other one, um, which I like that it's set in the, you know, in the medieval era, somebody says we should improve society somewhat. And then Facebook's thing comes up. This could be extremist content, right? Okay, so I think two restoration wars are happening right now. And this is where I'll begin to wrap up. The first one is the, the uh, reactionary uh, religious nationalist fascist one that's happening in the US. The, from the MAGA, right, Make America Great Again, the, the Trumpist one that was, has been going on for some time. Um, that restoration, very classic, like, let's restore America, let's restore, but not just America, let's restore this fantasy of Europe um, that usually is like some combination of Rome and Sparta and, uh, and, and Nazi Germany that, that, uh, that they want to. Uh, and so, so, I, so my book that's coming out in January, the title has changed. Uh, it's no longer Death Style Fascism. That one, I might write that book too, but it's called... Uh, on microfascism, gender, death, and war. And the cover is already out. Um, uh, the book should be out in January with Common Notions Press. Um, so uh, and so I, I, this is where I'm studying that restoration war um, is, is in that book. But the restoration war two, um, the second one is the one I've been talking about today with conspiracy panics and the, and the, the inside the, the the, the restoration of centrism, the restoration of trust in news, uh, the restoration of public trust. It's done through this idea of war and through the language of war. So I'm, it's not my language. I just say, oh, this is a war. This is the language used by the restorationists. Um, information war, um, there's a, you know, the news around fake war. Uh, the Russian hacking was 9-11 scale event, right? They're constantly, the constantly, the, 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 the panickers are using the language of, um, of warfare to describe what's happening. And so I say, okay, well, let's talk about what this war actually is. Um, and um, this is the FBI agent testifying to, con to Congress and he calls it a civil war. It's through information rebellions, this is 2017. Um, so I'm, I'm wrapping up last few slides. Um, more restoration. Uh, this was the defending democracy program inside of uh, something called NewsGuard, a Microsoft security patch for restoring trust and accountability. And they called it a SWAT team of analysts that are on call 24 seven. And if you look at who's on the advisory boards of these kinds of uh, operations, they tend to be an alliance, this nexus that I'm talking about, you know, uh, ex-security uh, agency people, uh, journalists, 
uh, academics, uh, media, media makers. And, um, uh, and so the sort of last kind of thing I want to say, let me see, the last, yeah, is, the, is that I call this also a kind of war of restore points. So if, if you're familiar with computers and if you get a virus uh, sometimes, sometimes you have to um, erase, right? You, you, the restore point takes you back in time um, to an image and, and where your computer was before the virus showed up, right? So you can, so it's a restore point. So it's a very, um, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a technical language too. So I think now this, what we're seeing is this kind of war of restore points, like that seeks the return of this kind of, this fantasy of a world pre-virus, not virus in the corona sense, in the virus in the computer virus sense, pre-contagion um, uh, as a way to restore um, uh, sovereignty of the center. And, you know, uh, and Rebecca Solnit, great writer, wrote about this recently, stop glorifying centrism. Um, so people are now beginning to talk about it in, in these public sites. Um, and um, yeah, so I think what, we're, what, we're, what we need to do is think about how that war is being waged, who the actors are, and how conspiracy theories play into that, um, uh, into, into that interaction. So I'll, I'll leave it there. So thanks for your attention. It's been a it's been some, uh, it is almost an hour. So, um, so thanks. It went long and, um, appreciate it. Thank you.